So, may I begin? Is this thing on? Yes, I think so. I hate microphones, but <clears throat> I guess I'm supposed to use it, so I will. Uh, it's a real honor for me to be here, and I want to thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to tell you a uh, curious story about uh, electrodynamics, but before I start, I want you to understand there's nothing deep or sophisticated about what I'm doing today. It's supposed to be perfectly intelligible, most of it, to a first-year student. Uh, the question is, how does charge distribute itself over a... Um, over, over a conducting object. So imagine uh, taking a, uh, a wrench or a hammer or something in outer space, no electric fields or no magnetic field, none of that stuff, just a, a conductor, isolated conductor, and you put some electric charge on it. The question is, how does that charge distribute itself over the conducting object? Um, I'm not talking about time-dependent problems or anything, just electrostatics. Okay, this is based on some work done with uh, senior thesis students at Reed College, where I'm from, and a couple of colleagues also. So, the issue is, how does charge distribute itself over a conductor? A curious thing, by the way, uh, that there are very few problems in textbooks on how does charge distribute itself over, over a conductor. There's some simple geometries where everybody knows the answer, but apart from very simple geometries, this is not a question that's often asked uh, for very good reason, uh, namely that it's uh, extremely difficult to answer in any but the simplest <laughs> geometries. <coughs> Well, we all know from a uh, first-year physics course that the charge on a conductor all goes to the surface. Um, and this is because of the mutual repulsion of all the, uh, the uh, of, uh, equal charges, of course. Uh, but how do you actually prove that all of the charge goes to the surface? Well, there's a two-step proof, the standard two-step proof. First of all, you ask, what is, what is a conductor? A conductor is a material that contains an essentially uh, unlimited supply of charge that's free to move around under the influence of an electric field. So if you took a conductor here, I imagine a, a sort of a rectangular <coughs> or a solid hunk of, hunk of uh, conducting material, a metal, say, and I stick it into an external field, uh, external electric field uh, that's pointing to the right, that's going to drive positive charges over to the right side and drive negative charges over to the left side. Yes, I know that it's actually, in practice, negatively charged electrons that do the moving, but that leaves a depletion of electron, electrons on the right-hand side, which is perfectly equivalent to a positive charge. You're familiar with this argument, I'm sure. Now, the important point is that that, indu that uh, induced charge driven over there by the external field, uh, the positive charges piling up here and the negative charges piling up here produce their own electric field pointing from positive toward the negative. So, and this is the critical point, uh, the induced electric field, the field of the induced charges there points in the opposite direction to the direction of the field that caused it for points inside the, uh, the conductor. For exterior points, that's not true. They may, may very well point in the same direction. But for places inside the conductor, the induced field always points in the opposite direction to the direction of the field that caused it. And, uh, and in fact, the, the, charge, uh, the buildup of charge here continues until that induced field exactly, exactly cancels the external field so that the net field inside the conductor is equal to zero. There's a f uh, very familiar argument that the uh, field inside a conductor is exactly zero, except for that brief, brief, uh, fra tiny fraction of a second when the charge was rearranging itself over there. But for all practical purposes, uh, as soon as you stick the conductor into an electric field, uh, external field, it kills off the field inside. The field inside a conductor is exactly zero. There's step one in the argument. Uh, step two is to apply now Gauss's law. Gauss's law says that the divergence of E is equal to one over epsilon naught times the charge density. If E is zero inside the conductor, the total electric field is zero, then rho, the charge density, must be zero. 
Therefore, the charge must be on the surface because there's nowhere else for it to go. If it can't be in the meat of the, of the conductor, it's got to be on the surface. So there's the, the standard argument, absolutely um, impeccable argument for why the charge, density, the charge on a conductor has to go to the surface. However, in my experience teaching uh, first year students, uh, they all uh, will accept the first argument that the electric field is equal to zero, but they have very often a kind of shaky grasp of what Gauss's law is really saying. So uh, often I don't find that the second part of the argument is completely compelling <coughs> to beginning students. So one, one year I found myself making a, a sort of homely um, analogy to, in an effort to convince the students that the charge density on a conductor, that the charge on a conductor all goes to the surface. I found myself saying, making the following, telling the following story. By the way, if you're, uh, if you become a teacher, uh, let me warn you, don't ever make up a, an analogy on the spur of the moment in a lecture. It's asking for real trouble, and this is a, a good example of it. So I, uh, I said to the students, um, remember what the issue is. Why does the charge all go, all go to the surface? I said, imagine that you're in a room full of people who all smell really bad. Uh, <laughs> and can you imagine what would happen that everybody is backing off, trying to get as far as, as they can from everybody else until finally they're all plastered ar around, the, uh, around the walls of the room. And that's exactly the same story with electrons in a, in a conductor. They're repelling each other, just like the smelling people would repel each other, and that pushes them back to the wall, and then they've got no further to go. So that's why the charge on a conductor all goes to the surface. Now, the reason it's a bad idea to make up an analogy like this is that, of course, uh, some clever students say, well, that seems like kind of a waste of all the space in the the middle of the room. If I were in that room with smelly people and I saw all the others going to the uh, going to the edges, I'd head for the center of the room, uh, and uh, and probably would not be so bad there. And uh, of course, that destroyed my lecture. Um, <laughs> But it started me also brooding on the subject. Uh, why, why really, how are we supposed to think about the fact that the charge on a conductor all goes to the surface, which it certainly does. I know that from the, uh, from the proof that I gave you there. But, uh, but how should you think about that? Why, why is it true? And uh, the more I thought about this problem, uh, the more it, it depends actually on two critical facts. First of all, the dimensionality of the conductor you're talking about. Because for a three-dimensional object, like a potato, or said, well, potato's not a conductor, but a conducting potato, the charge, <laughs> the charge really does go to the surface. But for a two-dimensional object, a disk, say, or, uh, or a sheet, uh, the charge doesn't all go to the periphery, which would be, uh, which would be the analogous statement for uh, the two-dimensional conductor or a one-dimensional conductor, a, a needle here or a noodle, uh, if it's a one-dimensional, one the charge does not all go to the two, uh, to the two ends or to the, to the circumference. So the statement that charge on a conductor all goes to the surface depends critically on the three-dimensionality of the conductor. It also depends critically on the 1 over r nature of Coulomb's law. Well, 1 over r squared if you're talking about the field, 1 over r if you're talking about the potential. The fact that the potential goes like 1 over r, exactly like 1 over r, is critical to the fact that the charge on a conductor all goes to the surface. If you tweak that, uh, the formula, it, it's no longer true that the charge goes to the surface. So what I'm going to do today is explore those two those two um, situations, one two-dimensional and one-dimensional conductors, and uh, modified versions of Coulomb's law, uh, variants on Coulomb's law, and find out where the charge density goes in those cases. So that's the agenda. The, uh, as I uh, suggested at the very beginning, by the way, although, uh, although 
it's easy to, to say that the charge on a three-dimensional conductor all goes to the surface. Exactly how it distributes itself over that surface is not an easy problem. Uh, you've done the case of a sphere, of course, a sphere, it's going to distribute uniformly over the surface. A cylinder, it's going to go uniformly over the surface. Uh, an infinite plane, uh, slab, it would go uniformly over the surface. But for anything more complicated than that, I ask you, have you ever been asked to calculate how the charge would distribute itself, for instance, over the surface of a cube? I don't think so, and for a good reason. Uh, there are not many problems of that, uh, m not many geometries, except for the trivial ones, where you can actually calculate how the charge, dis of course you could do it numerically on a computer, but, uh, but uh, how you can, uh, not many cases that you can analytically calculate the distribution of charge over the surface uh, of a three-dimensional object. One exception, uh, a classic exception from the 19th century is the ellipsoid, an ellipsoidal conductor. This, I mean, an ellipsoid, not an ellipsoid of revolution. I got three different uh, semi-major axes here. So x squared over this is a formula for an ellip ellipsoid, of course. A, B, and C in general, uh, different. So there's the shape. And in the 19th century already, it was uh, discovered what the, how charge distributes itself over uh, the surface of an, an ellipsoid, a conducting ellipsoid. If you put a total charge Q onto that ellipsoid, the charge density, charge per unit area over the surface is given by this lovely formula here. Uh, really is a lovely formula, by the way, because it has many, uh, many special cases that are of interest. But um, before I come to that, uh, this is a slightly misleading formula because after all, the surface of a of a ellipsoid is two dimensional, and yet I've written this as a function of three variables, x squared, y, x, y, and z. Uh, so what's going on here? Well, of course, the three, the three coordinates are not independent because if you're on the surface of the ellipsoid, they're related by the, the formula for the ellipsoid. So I could, uh, for example, use this equation to eliminate either the x or the y or the z. I'm going to eliminate the z. And uh, I don't want to write out the details, but I think you can imagine what happens if I take the c and put it inside. So I've got a c squared there and a c squared there. And here, z squared over c squared now. I could take that z squared over c squared and replace it by 1 minus x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared to see how it's going to go. And then I will have a formula that just depends on x and y. That's going to tell me the charge density. If I want to appoint x, y in the uh, a point in the x, y plane, x comma y, and, I, and then I went up above that to the surface of the ellipsoid, uh, and I want to know what is the charge density at that point. Now, as a function of x and y, that's what my formula is going to tell me. Of course, same charge uh, down below also. So here's the implementation of what I was just saying, uh, a rather uglier looking formula, which is the reason why we always write it in the previous way, even though that had three variables where it deserves only two. Okay. Uh, so here's, uh, here's the shape of the object we're talking about, an ellipsoid. Uh, but remember, I was going to tell you about two-dimensional and one-dimensional uh, uh, objects. So suppose that I took that ellipsoid and, and stomp on it so that it flattens out into an ellipse. How would I do that mathematically? Well, it's pretty trivial. What, what you would do is you set, for instance, c equal to zero, because that would mean that the that the uh, distance in this dimension is equal to zero, and the thing flattens out to uh, to just an ellipse. So uh, take this general formula here and set c equal to zero. Well, that's trivial. It kills this term, and it kills this term, and it leaves everything else. So the answer is sigma of x and y is q over 2 pi a b square root 1 minus x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared. Lovely. There is the formula for the charge density on an elliptical plate, an ellip elliptical disk, OK? And I get it just by taking the ellipsoid, which I know in general, and squashing it flat. Uh, if you're looking very carefully, you'll notice that I also multiplied by 2 instead of a 4 there. This is now a 2. Do you see why that's true? 
because when I squat this ellipsoid down, I now have the top surface coinciding with the bottom surface. So the net charge density at each point is twice what it would have been for just the top surface alone. Okay, so there's the formula for the charge density on a conducting elliptical plate. You can extract from that several interesting cases. Suppose that A was equal to B, uh, that would be a circular plate, huh? Uh, so charge density on a circular plate I can get from this. There are actually a number of different ways to get the charge density on a circular plate, but this is the, the cutest one, I think. So suppose that A was equal to B, and I might as well call that capital R, the radius of this circular disk. I'm going to bring one of the, uh, the B inside, B now an R, the A is also an R, and then I would have R squared minus the A squared would cancel and the B squared would cancel, so it would be R squared minus X squared minus Y squared. Well, let's tidy that up. Here's the formula for the charge density on a circular conducting disk, 2 pi R square root of R squared minus R squared. Here's the disk. And, uh, oh, little r squared, of course, is uh, x squared plus y squared. Um, the cylindrical geometry makes a, a r the natural coordinate there. Now, if I plot this as a function of r, the charge density as a function of r, it does blow up, actually, at uh, little r equals capital R. In other words, at the very surface, the charge per unit area actually is infinite. Uh, that's nothing alarming. The charge itself is not infinite. Uh, you integrate over it, you would get a finite amount. In fact, you get Q if you integrate over the entire entire plate, but the charge density itself blows up. Uh, as the student, as my student said, uh, I can understand that maybe a lot of the people would go to the periphery, but surely there should be a few uh, clever people who would stay in the middle. And that actually he was completely right because uh, after all, a room is in this sense a two-dimensional object. Those people should not have all gone to the surface. We know here, well, assuming that smell obeys uh, <laughs> Coulomb's law, that uh, <laughs> they really, a few of them really should have stayed uh, toward the center. There should have been a, a preference for the for the circumference. That's true, but uh, but it's not not all of it would go to the surface. So there's uh, my first example to show that in two-dimensional objects, if you run the analogous argument, it's simply false. Not all of the charge would go to the surface. So the people in this room, smelly people in the room, should not all go to the edge. On the other hand, astronauts in the space station or something, having access to the ceiling and the floor as well, they, sh they really should go to the, to the periphery, to the, to, the, to the walls and the ceiling and the floor. Uh, that's the best place for them um, if they're smelly. So <laughs> there's the circular disk. Now, another thing that we could do, another limiting case of the, um, of the formula for the charge density on an ellipse here is the infinite ribbon. Suppose that I had an infinite ribbon, uh, finite, finite width, but infinitely long ribbon. That is actually a limiting case of an ellipse also. That's the limiting case of the ellipse when uh, C, first of all, went to zero. We've already done that. And now I want B to go to infinity, but I hold A finite. Then, I, then I've flattened it and stretched it out, and it's become an infinitely long ribbon. In this case, of course, the total charge on the thing, capital Q, will be infinite. So I don't want to talk about the total charge, but rather the charge per unit length on that ribbon which would be Q over 2B, actually, because the length of this thing is effectively 2, 2B, B, B in each direction. So, uh, so I'm going to introduce a new variable instead of capital Q. Uh, we'll call it capital lambda, which is the charge, net charge per unit length on this infinite ribbon, and it's Q over 2B. So lambda equals Q over 2B, and now I'm going to set B to infinity. The formula was, uh, well, it, was, uh, it had been Q over 
2 pi a b, but I've taken lambda over 2 b is it just, uh, I'm sorry, q over 2 b is replaced by lambda, so it's got pi a over root 1 minus x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared, but now I want to send b to infinity, so that kills that term, and it's lambda over pi root a squared over uh, a squared minus x squared. So there's the formula for the charge density on an infinite conducting ribbon as a function of x, of course, the distance across the, uh, across the ribbon. Once again, it's got rabbit ears at the two edges. There's a preference for charge to go to the, to the two edges of the, of the ribbon, but it doesn't all go there. Some of it stays, uh, some of it stays in the center of the, uh, of the ribbon. Uh, and just like the disk problem, um, there's, there's a second, uh, a second example in which in a two-dimensional object, the charge doesn't go all, all to the surface, all to the periphery it would be. Well, enough on two-dimensional uh, configurations. How about a one-dimensional configuration? What if I uh, went all the way down to uh, just a finite wire, a needle, if you like? What's the charge density on a uh, conducting needle? You can get this, of course, by taking the limiting case of the um, uh, formally taking the limiting case as not just uh, b, not just c goes to zero, but also b goes to zero. So there's just, uh, but there's actually a much lovelier way to do this um, uh, to find out what the charge density on a um, on a finite piece of wire is. And that's uh, to exploit a theorem that was uh, discovered actually by one of my uh, one of my thesis students. So I listed on the first one. Here's what the theorem says: If you go back to the um, to the ellipsoid and imagine imagine that ellipsoid as a loaf of bread, and you run that loaf of bread through a uh, a bread slicer. You know what, uh, I've actually seen these in Holland, so they still exist here in America. I've, most students don't know what you're talking about, about a bread slicer, because there isn't such a thing anymore. You buy your bread already sliced. But if you go to a bakery and ask them to slice up the bread into, uh, you understand what I'm talking about, it slices it into even, uh, even slices for making toast. Well, that, the, the theorem says that if you run the ellipsoid through a bread slicer, that each of those slices gets exactly the same amount of charge as all of the others, according, according to this formula here. I mean, it's just a geometrical fact about that formula that if you, if you take the ellipsoid and slice it up perpendicular, I, I mean, uh, perpendicular to any one of the three principal axes, slice it up into, uh, into equal slices, each one of those slices will get the same amount of charge. Well, maybe not the two end ones if you didn't happen to exactly slice it so it came out even, but, uh, but apart from that, the, each sli the point is that each, each segment of a given length carries the same amount of charge as all of the other segments. Uh, when I first saw that, I thought that can't possibly be true because I know very well that charge density, uh, charge tends to accumulate where the curvature is greatest. So I'd say in this picture, I, the charge density be larger around here than it is here where the, where the curvature is not so great. Yes, that's true, but uh, the size of the slice of bread is smaller at the end also, and those two effects exactly cancel each other. So the amount of charge on each slice is equal. I didn't mean, mean to make that sound like such a complicated argument, but you understand what I'm saying. And do you understand what the implication is for the, for if I take this ellipsoid now and squeeze it down to a cigar and then keep on squeezing it down all the way to a needle, it still is the case because that theorem was, was a general for whatever the, the three axes are, that the charge on each little slice is exactly the same as on all the other slices, which tells me that the charge density on a conducting needle is constant. It's uniform. Astonishing. That means that if the smelly people were in a hallway, a long hallway, then they shouldn't go to the ends at all. They should uniformly distribute themselves down the hall. There's no preference for the ends at all, right? Whoops. Oh, no. Oh, no. <coughs> Hit the wrong button there. Sorry. Okay. 
there we are, whoops. Uh, the charge density on a conducting needle is constant. Now, of course, you know that if it was an infinitely long line, the charge density would obviously be uniform. I'm not talking about an infinite line, I'm talking about a finite line. Uh, you know, 10 centimeters long, a piece of straight wire, the claim is that the charge density, if you put charge onto that thing, the charge will be uniformly distributed along the length. When I first saw this, I was, uh, I thought it was so, so obviously incorrect uh, that I put another uh, thesis student onto the problem of finding out what the right answer is, since, <laughs> since the charge density on a needle cannot possibly be uniform. Let me prove that to you. Uh, the proof is false, by the way, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but let me prove it to you. Uh, suppose that we kind of focused our attention on some, so here's the, here's the needle, and they tell me that uh, the charge on that needle is going to be uniformly distributed along the line. Okay, let's look at one of, the, one of those charges in there. I've made it big so you, can, so you can see it. There's one of the charges on that wire, and they say that the charge should be uniformly distributed down the wire. That means that each charge there will be in equilibrium. Uh, except for the two that happen to be at the very ends, which can't go anywhere anyhow because uh, they can't get off the wire. But all the others should be in uh, electrostatic equilibrium there. Well, I'm going to prove to you that this charge is certainly not in equilibrium because think of it, all the charge to the right of it is pushing it to the left, and there's an equal amount in this segment here that I call B that's pushing it to the right. So those two exactly cancel. And then there's all this stuff down here that's left over. So there should be a net force on Q pointing to the right. Is that obvious? I think so. Actually, this is a diabolical example of the dangers of conditional convergence. Um, Mathematicians should use this when they're talking about uh, uh, conditional convergence of an in integral or a series. Uh, conditional, uh, conditionally convergent integral, you know, can be made to, uh, to integrate to any value you want to by the order in which you add up the pieces. And this is an example that actually the force on this charge due to the stuff to the right is infinite. Right, because some of the charge there is actually very close to it, and if you uh, just set up the integral, you'll find that the, the force due to the due to C is infinite. The force due to B is infinite, and what I was doing really is subtracting two infinities and having some finite bit left over, and the, the argument is simply is simply invalid. But it looks awfully convincing. So as I say, I uh, I had another thesis student, and I said. Uh, let's uh, let's figure out what the charge density really is on a on a conducting needle, since we know it cannot possibly be uniform. As the other, then the next problem was going to be find out what's wrong with the argument based on the limit of the ellipsoid. Actually, the argument based on the limit of the ellipsoid is perfectly valid. Is this argument is not valid? So, Ye Li, the, uh, the next student, had an ingenious idea for this. I thought it was ingenious uh, of discretizing the charge, imagining that I have on this wire not, you know, smoothly distributed charge all the way along the line, but let's take the charge capital Q that we're going to stick on there, and first of all, have it just be in one big lump. Where is it going to go then? I imagine, for instance, that I have a glass rod and then a charged bead, and I stick onto that uh, glass rod, a bead that can slide back and forth. A charged bead, if I put all of the charge onto, uh, onto one bead, uh, it can float. There's no reason that it should go uh, one place or another because there's no force on it. If I take that total charge Q and stick it, divide it into two beads and stick them onto the glass rod, then is it pretty clear what they would do? they would repel each other off and half, half would go uh, to each side. So if you had two, if you chopped it into two equal pieces, they would obviously go to the two ends. N equals three, if you chop it into three equal pieces, well, two of them are gonna clearly go to the end, and the third one by symmetry is gonna sit at the center. 
those three cases are obvious, and it's always the case that two of the two of the charges are going to go to the very end. But what happens to the stuff in the middle is uh, no longer trivial after you get to four. It's actually a quartic equation. What you want to do is uh, insist that this charge here and the symmetrically placed one over there should be in equilibrium under the influence of the repulsive, this one, uh, due to the repulsive force of those two that are further away and the attractive force, if we're talking about to the right, of this one here. I didn't say that very well, but you understand what I'm saying. You want each of the charges on there to be, to have zero net force acting on it, just by Coulomb's law. Well, it turns out that, uh, that for n equals four, these two, it's a quartic equation to, uh, to find what the separation distance would be, then the equilibrium position that they would go to. But Mathematica is not frightened of for, uh, quadratic, uh, quartic equations, and this happens to be the answer. Remember, the total length here is actually 2a, using the a that came from the, uh, the uh, total length of the ellipsoid was, was 2a. So that happens to be the number, the distance between those two charges. And well, you can do it for n equals five also. What's the position? This one, it's obvious. This one, it's obvious. This one, it's obvious. And, and this one's a mirror image of this one. So you've got one, one distance to calculate. Stick it on Mathematica. That's an even nastier <laughs> equation. And n equals six, and so on. So yeah, did this uh, calculation for n equals 10, n equals 20, and a whole lot in between, and went up to n equals 100. At this point, uh, he became very unpopular uh, at Reed because he was using the college's mainframe computer and taking uh, entire weekends to do a calculation like that. Uh, now you can actually do quite, quite a bit faster, but, uh, but this takes a lot of computer time if you're calculating for a relatively large number of these charges. Now, what he's plotted here is the effective charge density that corresponds to n equals 10. So if you stick 10, divide the, uh, divide the uh, charge into 10 equal pieces, it will distribute itself with an effective charge density that looks like that. You can see the rabbit ears building up at the two ends, but uh, not zero in the center. This is exactly what we had anticipated that uh, before uh, we anticipated in spite of the argument that the charge density should be uniform, which I didn't believe. Uh, <coughs> It, that it would push itself out to the to the edges, and uh, after getting up to 100, uh, I was convinced that we that we had reached the limit. And the question was, what's the functional form of that graph? Would be very in, uh, interesting conclusion. That the, what is the functional form for the charge per unit length on a finite wire with a charge uh, Q? on it. It looks like there's, there's some kind of an equation that should describe that. If you, I tell you that if you take, uh, take these plots, as we did, and put them onto transparencies and hold them up to the light, you can see difference between n equals 10 and n equals 15. But above n equals 15, you cannot visually tell any difference, any change between n equals 15 and n equals 100. It sounded as though we've really reached, uh, reached the limit Limiting, limiting case of this curve here, uh, or so I believed. And because this is not flat, I concluded that uh, that this is there is some other function here. What is that function? Uh, that point, I actually had a, a colleague who was from Brazil, and uh, that fact is relevant because Brazil. Uh, when it had a nuclear weapons program, invested heavily in supercomputers. And then they canceled their nuclear weapons program. And so Brazil to this day has a bunch of very powerful computers that nobody knows what to do with. They don't have, uh, so if you're a Brazilian physicist, you can get easy free time on supercomputers. Uh, I don't know about Holland, but in the United States, it's very difficult to get time, time on a supercomputer. But uh, so uh, Oz had access to this uh, supercomputer in Brazil, and he sent his problem down there with uh, n equals 16,000. That's two to the something or other. I don't know uh, what it is. But anyhow, uh, and with 
for n equals 16,000, the solid line is what you get. And for n equals 32, this was the old uh, one that we had calculated before, you notice that by the time you've gone up to 16,000, you start to see actual difference between the, the curves. And moreover, it clearly is flattening out here, right? And there's less and less charge uh, stored in the, in the two, uh, what I call the rabbit ears, at the end. It certainly looks as though uh, this is heading for uniform distribution uh, along the line, and indeed it is. The trouble is that this is a case of monstrously slow convergence. I've never hit a problem like this in my life. Usually, you know, a physicist assumes that things are going to converge pretty fast, and ordinarily they do. If you go up to n equals 100, that should be the answer. But, um, but in this case, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's not. Uh, this point, by the way, uh, J.D. Jackson, the author of the um, graduate level textbook on uh, electrodynamics and sort of the world's authority on electrodynamics, got interested in the problem. And he proved that the charge density on a, on a conducting wire of arbitrary cross-section so imagine, hmm, I don't know how to say this. If you, uh, uh, you know what a lathe is, the machine that, uh, that uh, you can turn a piece of wood and it will, it will make nice, nice pattern. That, anyhow, it, however, the charge, charge, however the shape of the, of the wire varies down the line, in the limit, as the, as the size goes to zero, the charge density will always be uniform. But he also uh, had to deal with very nasty slow convergence. So uh, enough on the first part. Uh, it is, if you want to take home from all this, the charge density on a, uh, on a finite one-dimensional object, uh, a needle, the charge density is uniform. It distributes itself uniformly along the line, although if the charge was discretized in, uh, to small amounts, then it, it would not be. But, uh, and by the way, uh, I'm now convinced that uh, it doesn't depend on the fact that it's a straight line either. The conducting needle, the charge density on a conducting needle is also, uh, conducting noodle in a curved shape is also uniform along the line, as long as it doesn't have kinks in it. If it bent it at a right angle, that's different. But uh, now let me say a few words uh, about uh, changing the potential, changing the form of the potential. Instead of the Coulomb potential, what if we tried a Yukawa potential? This is exactly the Coulomb potential, but with an extra exponential uh, factor uh, like this, with a parameter mu, a constant parameter mu. If mu was zero, this would be back to the the Coulomb potential, right? Because then you then you just wouldn't have this term here. So that's a, a handy thing to remember because we can test all of our results by setting mu to zero, and this should recover the um, the uh, ordinary Coulomb case. I'm proud to say that in my book, there's a there's a question, uh, a problem, which is to figure out what Gauss's law would look like if the potential, the formula for the potential of a point charge was Yukawa instead of Coulomb, and it's a nifty problem. Here's, here's the answer. Gauss's law now involves not just the divergence of E, but also the potential comes into it, but the formula is kind of sweet. There's, uh, there's Gauss's law for uh, Yukawa type potential. Now, question, how does the charge distribute itself on a conductor if the potential had been Yukawa instead of Coulomb? The first part of the argument is still perfectly valid, that the electric field inside the conductor would be zero. <laughs> Moreover, because the electric field inside the conductor is zero, the potential difference between any two points inside the conductor is also zero. In other words, the conductor's got to be an equal potential. So a, con a conductor would have E equals zero and V equals a constant. Well, that tells me immediately that rho has got to be a constant. Astonishing. That says that with the potential had been Yukawa instead of uh, Coulomb, then the rule would be 
that the charge is uniformly distributed throughout the volume of that object. Well, not all of it, because there still might be some left over on the surface, but within the volume of the object, it's going to be uniformly distributed. This was actually known uh, in the mid-90s, mid I think. Uh, uh, it was known for certain special geometries, like uh, spherical geometry. The, the, uh, for a sphere, the charge is uniformly distributed throughout the volume, and then there's a, there's a skin. Uh, in fact, here's, here's the formula. Not, not too difficult to work out. Uh, the, for the charge density on a sphere, uh, the charge density throughout the volume is given by this formula here, and the charge on the surface is given by this formula here. Should we check those? If mu was zero, if mu is zero, then this term disappears and this term disappears. I've still got the mu squared in the numerator. Rho is equal to zero, which is right. That's the Coulomb case. There would be no charge in the volume. How about the charge on the surface? Well, if mu is zero, this term dies, this term dies, this term dies, and I get Q over 4 pi r squared. That's exactly right. Uniform distribution of charge over the surface. But in general, depending on what the value of mu is, not all of the charge would go to the surface if you had a Yukawa potential. And this is the formula for what, uh, what you would get. By the way, there's another limit there that's kind of intriguing to me, although I don't know what to make of this. But what if mu went to infinity? Well, if mu is infinity, then for any r not zero, this, this thing gives you zero. So uh, let's not make it infinity, but just very huge, OK? For very, very large mu, what happens to these formulas? If very, very large mu, the mu squared term is going to dominate in the denominator, and those two I could throw away. Now the mu squareds cancel, and I get q over 4 thirds pi r cubed. Huh. All of it's distributed throughout the volume. Therefore, there must be none left over at the surface. Let's check that. If mu goes to infinity, I have q times the 1 is irrelevant. And down here, these are irrelevant. I've got mu over mu squared. That's 1 over mu, and mu is going to infinity, so I get 0. So in the limit of a very large mu, the Yukawa potential puts all of the charge uniformly within the conductor and leaves 0 uh, for the surface. Uh, Kind of a curious, curious fact. OK, enough on the Yukawa potential. Another thing that you might uh, imagine to doctor up the potential, to experiment with an other potentials than the Coulomb one, is to try a different power law potential. If n was equal to 1, then this would be the ordinary Coulomb case, q, q over r. But now we're going to explore different values of n and see if the charge all goes to the surface in that case, the answer, of course, is, uh, is that it doesn't, or I wouldn't be showing you this example. Here's the formula for a sphere. In this case, there is no, as far as I know, there's no general rule like the one for the Yukawa is very clean. Well, Coulomb is very clean. All the charge goes to the surface. Yukawa is very clean. Some of the charge goes to the surface, and some of the, the rest of it is uniformly distributed throughout the volume. For the power laws, except for n equals 1, well, and actually n equals 3, uh, there is no general rule like that, but you can look at specific geometries. And for a sphere, here is the formula for rho as a function of r, charge density as a function of r, for arbitrary n n only in the range from 1 to 3, for reasons I can explain to you if you, if you like. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to look outside of that range. 1, one to 3 is the, uh, is the reasonable range for this particular problem. All this junk out in front, by the way, is just uh, const constants. Don't focus on that. It's r squared minus little r squared. There's a sphere, so I'm talking about the total radius of the sphere and the distance from the center, raised to the n minus 3 over 2 power. Well, if n is equal to 1, I'm sorry, let's see, n equals 1 is the one is uh, uh, the case, uh, the Coulomb case. 
Uh, I can't plot that on here because we know what, uh, what the Coulomb case does. The charge is distributed all on the surface. So if I plot the charge density as a function of radius, this is the, uh, uh, the radius is normalized to one here. It should have been zero all the way along and then suddenly a delta function spike at the radius. So I haven't plotted that. Mathematica doesn't like to plot uh, delta functions, but I started with n equals 1.1, which is pretty close, then most of the charge is right out at the surface, but not quite all of it. Um, and then if you crank up n going up toward toward 3, that's what the, what the graphs look like. More and more of the charge is located Inside the inside the sphere, and less and less right out at the uh, edge until when you hit n equals three. Well, n equals three, the exponent dies. This whole term is just one, so the charge density is constant. Why is that? So, uh, if n was equal to three, if n was equal to three in the replacement of Coulomb's law here, instead of one, it had been three then the charge density on a conductor in that world, the rule would be the charge is uniformly distributed throughout the volume. That doesn't depend on the, on the spherical geometry, by the way. Uh, there's a general, a general proof that we worked out that regardless of the geometry, if n is equal to 3, the charge is going to be uniformly distributed throughout the volume and none left over on the surface. Another case that you can uh, calculate is the slab here. I'm sorry, this doesn't look infinite, but it's supposed to be infinite in the y and x direction. And then I'm interested in the charge, uh, in terms of the charge per unit area, now total charge per unit area that I call sigma on this, uh, what, how the charge density varies as you go across this slab. Again, there's a bunch of constants out in front, but then it's d, d over 2 is, uh, d is the, uh, is the width of the slab, sorry, uh, d squared over 4 minus z squared, again raised to that same power, n minus 3 over 2. And if you plot that again for n equals for n equals 1, the Coulomb case, it should be 0 and then a delta function at the two ends. For 1.1, it's a little bit above that, and it uh, creeps up to n equals 3. It's absolutely uniform across there. So if Coulomb's law had said uh, charge uh, that um, the potential goes like 1 over r cubed, then the charge density on a slab uh, would be absolutely uniform across the, uh, across the volume. So those are my examples to convince you that uh, that the charge, the fact that the charge goes to the surface on a conductor depends uh, not just on the dimensionality of the conductor, but also on the detailed nature of Coulomb's law. It's not something perfectly obvious that since electrons repel each other, they must go to the edges, or smelly people repel each other, they've got to go to the edge. It's not, uh, that doesn't do the job. Uh, the charge distribution on a conductor is not at all obvious. Uh, and if students are surprised that it goes to the surface, uh, they maybe have better, uh, better intuitions about it than we do, at least if we're claiming, as I did, that that was supposed to be perfectly obvious if you think about it right. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you for the nice presentation. Um, I have a question. The, maybe it's very simply thought, but in the end, you said if it's to the power of three, then for three-dimensional objects, it would be uniform. Power of one, it would be one-dimensional objects would be uniformly distributed. Is it then for two-dimensional objects, the square would be uniform? Good question. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll say this much. That your that what you said was very clever and uh, and absolutely true. That mathematically, the fact that on the slab, 
for n equals three, it's absolutely uniform, is mathematically the identical problem to n equals one on a one-dimensional object. In other words, there's a, tr a translation scheme there uh, that uh, when you when you reduce the dimension by by one, uh, that's equivalent to mathematically to increasing the power of n in Coulomb's law. Uh, I didn't say that very well, but but I'm I'm repeating exactly what you were suggesting, and it. And it's exactly true. The, it's, it's no accident that for n equals three, you get uniform distribu distribution here, or rather it's exactly the same accident that for a one dimensional object using n equals one, you get uniform distribution of charge. So now coming back to your question, for <coughs> n equals two on a two dimensional object, do you also get uniform charge distribution? Yes. Thank you. I have one other yes. small question. I, I haven't fiddled much with, uh, frankly, with non-Coulombic potentials for, um, for non-three-dimensional objects. You know, the way that, that, the way that I did this for the, for the non-Coulombic cases, I was always using three dimensions. And for the other ones, I was always using uh, Coulomb's law. But, um, but you're quite right. In that case, I, kn I know the answer. Okay, I had one small other one. Why didn't you tell the students that the people could bend their knees or something, and that would have solved it, wouldn't it? Bend their knees? The one with the smelly people. Yes. That would make it three-dimensional then, and then it would <laughs> solve it, right? Wait a minute, how does that make it three-dimensional? If they can bend their knees, then they get higher or lower, and then you have oh, the third oh, dimension. Oh, I see, I see. Yes, okay, that'll do it. No, the example that came to my mind was uh, the was the astronauts. But, but of course, when I said this in the, in the lecture, I didn't realize that there was any problem with the argument at all. I thought that uh, I, I thought that it was a much more general sort of geometrical principle. I'm embarrassed about this because, in retrospect, it seems uh, actually quite stupid to have assumed that it was just geometrical. Well, it is just geometrical, but it depends on two facts about geometry that that, that you're talking in three dimensions and that the cool and that the force law goes like one over r squared yeah or the smelliness was quadratic yes yeah, yeah. thank you very much sure <laughs> uh, so i understand from a uh, theoretical point of view if you take a, a needle that it will distribute uh, uniformly the charge but in real life, charge is basically uh, quantized because you have electrons. So if you That's take true, a very yeah. weakly charged needle, do you actually still get the bunny ears because your electrons will distribute that way? Or I, I suppose so. You know, um, I mean, uh, on an actual needle, you've got ten to the twenty-third charges on there. So you're you're away, even though even though it's very slow, actually logarithmic convergence uh, there. Even even for an actual conducting needle, there should be some extra charge uh, pushing out to the ends because because charge is quantized. You're right. Uh, I've, I've wondered sometimes whether that would conceivably be measurable, uh, but uh, I sort of don't think so. Well, if you make some some nano particles uh, very small, yeah, atomic wires, carbon yes. tubes, something like that. Uh, yeah, maybe it could be done. No, it, it, I mean, it, it, this would be a way of convincing yourself, if we didn't already know it, that uh, that charge is quantized, right? <laughs> I had a question about the, um, the, to the, the wire as well. It went flatter in the middle, but in the edges it still went up. And I can imagine that for um, if you go to infinite, it will be infinitely flat, but on the end it will still be very steep. Does it mean that in the end it, it has an infinite um, collection of particles and wouldn't that contradict or is it, if it, is it still yes. zero there? I think the better way to say it is how much total charge is there in the, should we call them the rabbit ears, the, the place where it's de uh, deviating substantially from, uh, from uniform charge distribution. And the, the way to argue it is that less and less of the total charge is in that rabbit ear. In, in relation to 
in relation to the total amount of charge. Okay. So a smaller and smaller fraction is, uh, is stored in the ends and in the limit, uh, zero fraction. So you can say the, the line still, still goes up for any finite number. That's right, but, but the amount of charge that's in that, that, in that region where it deviates from constant is going to zero. Okay. So in the limit, you might draw a vertical line there, but it's misleading because, because there's no charge in that uh, location. Thank you. By the way, you might, uh, you might think of a different way of approaching this whole problem, as we certainly did. In fact, I spent a long time on the, on the problem of why don't I take a uh, three-dimensional wire in the shape of a cylinder, a finite cylinder with the ends maybe cut off vertically, maybe hemispheres. I don't know, you can uh, try both of them. So I, I thought at first, well, I, all I need to do is look in one of the classic textbooks and find out how charge distributes itself over a uniform cylinder, finite cylinder. Well, interesting problem. Uh, but if you, uh, if you look in all the classic texts, you will not see that problem uh, uh, touched, with one exception, that's my uh, dynamic, static and dynamic electricity. And he did a big study of this. Um, a numerical study in the days when he had to type everything out on and and so uh, and he has a bunch of charts of how the how the, how much charge there is in he realized that the charge uh, that the charge gets large toward the end how much charge there is in that depending on the aspect ratio of the um, of the cylinder, but two two unfortunate things. First of all, uh, if you use a modern computer, you can check all his numbers very quickly, and uh, and about a third of them were incorrect. So, uh, not terribly reliable. And uh, and the second thing is that his the uh, his his uh, numerical cases are such that you can't simply uh, approach the aspect ratio of zero, in other words, zero radius compared to, compared to the length. There's a fellow in uh, Belgrade in Yugoslavia who's made a, uh, a big study of charge density on cylinders. And I wrote to him at, w at one point saying that, you know, I was getting this absurd answer that the charge density on a finite wire was zero, uh, was uniform. Uh, what, what was, uh, uh, I knew that he had done a bunch of uh, studies for finite cylinders. And I asked him um, what he was getting for a very, and, and he said, no, no, it's certainly not zero. And then a little while later, he wrote back and said, you know, you're right. It seems that uh, when the radius is getting smaller and smaller, smaller, as he put it, the amount of charge in the, in the end caps was, was getting, uh, the, uh, the amount, of, amount of charge in the end caps, which he defined as, you know, deviating by 1% or something like that from, from uniform uh, charge distribution, was get, uh, seemed to be going to zero. But he did it all entirely numerically. So. I just came up with something two seconds ago. Um, maybe some of you already know this answer. I, I didn't get that far in my study yet. But does um, curvature of space, because of gravity, uh, matter for the charge distribution in in objects? Because they're they're not. Is it still three dimensional, or or if they're going really fast, they're contracting in length compared to other? Does that matter? I don't know. <laughs> wow, it was a question that popped up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going wild. I don't know. I, uh, so, so in a curved space time, does the charge on a conductor all go to the surface? No. Does it, is, is it a, a special case? I can't imagine that maybe that size is I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. In, interesting question. So, in general relativity, does the rule still hold? Should, shouldn't be too difficult to, to work it out, actually. But, but I, I don't happen to know the answer. Hmm? 
Uh, then I want to thank you for your lecture. Most welcome.